a little better. Good. So I want to share the screen down here. Okay. And I hear that somebody has come in remotely. So please let me know if something's bad, like you can't hear my voice or you can't see the screen. Hi, Stacy. All right. So you can, you can certainly attend remotely and, uh, Get rid of these extra windows that don't matter right now. All right. And two minutes before the official start time. Uh, all right. The dates on there are a priority date maybe? I fixed them finally. Okay. Yes, the dates were wrong in this, and the day of the week was wrong in the online schedule. So those of you that actually made it here have done well at untangling the nonsense. Uh, the class will actually meet on Wednesdays, and not every Wednesday because it's only a one-unit class. So the meeting dates are here, 822, 912, and 103. In fact, that would be a good thing to write on the board. Holy cow. This is no longer a chalkboard. And there are, of course, no pens. So I won't be writing that on the board this time, but anyway, there's always something. Uh, anyway, the next meeting is 912. Um, if there were any pen, I would put the URL on the board, but I've got nothing, so we will carry on. There's all, I also don't have any paper to hand out because all the copiers are broken. But anyway, the only thing you need to know is my website, samsclass.info. Make a note of that, and we will cope. There's always something that goes wrong. All right, so this class is DNS security. It covers this one topic, which is relatively specialized, but important. Uh, securing DNS resources, and there's a lot of attacks against DNS. So, <clears throat> there's the book. I'm only going to cover about half of what's in this book. This book gets quite dense and, and mathematical at points, and we really don't need that. We're going to do the, uh, the important points, but the detailed math where he calculates the probability of certain attacks and stuff didn't seem worth the bother to me. Um, anyway, so we're going to talk about how to secure DNS servers and perform various attacks on them. And you'll set up DNS servers on Windows and Linux. You'll set up the official Windows DNS server, which is not used very much except by people with Windows domains, although it's pretty common. Uh, most people prefer Linux or other DNS servers, and you will see why, because the Windows DNS server is a sin and a shame. It's just appalling. Uh, there was a time before the 2002 Trustworthy Computing Memo, Microsoft just did not care how awful their products were. They certainly particularly didn't care about security, but they really didn't care about much of anything at all except bare functionality to get the money. And um, their DNS server dates from a really dark old time when Microsoft was very evil and very reviled. They've reformed, but the DNS product has not been updated. So you will see it as an example of how to do everything wrong. Anyway, so um, we'll set up those and we'll talk about zone transfers and uh, DNS sec and other Security extensions, DNS is actually pretty awful. Not only is it a huge functionality problem in that everything you do on the web requires good DNS and it's often not working well enough. Actually, can you pull those shades down back there? I think it might do something about this that's washing out the screen. Anyway, the, um, but the other thing about it is not only can you attack DNS, but um, it exposes your activities to privacy invasion. Everything you do on the web is constantly sent in plain text all over the place. This makes it very easy for anyone that wants to spy on what you do. And there was a recent report that said that uh, something like half of all the DNS resolutions on the web are, in fact, now intercepted and monitored and tampered with. So, you know, it is amazing that it's not encrypted and not, or authenticated, and it still is. And DNSSEC and DNS Curve and another one are all attempts to fix that. None of them are anywhere near useful deployment. All of them are fantasies for 10 years in the future. You can't do a bloody thing with any of them yet. But, uh, in my opinion, DNS over HTTPS is probably the best contender, but it's all, they're all still in an early beta version. Anyway, so you're going to learn how DNS works and what the flaws are and what you can do about it. Uh, your projects go in by email to CNET40. Uh, the quizzes are online. It's not the City College Canvas system, but one of my own. You should have an invitation in your City College email, and it's here. And uh, there's a homework to turn in and quizzes, and that adds up to a bunch of points. And um, 
I have a sheet which I'll print out on hand on paper. So there's six quizzes and six projects and a final exam, and that's it. 90% is an A, 80% is a B, and so on. And there's a whole bunch of extra credit projects that you can take to get more points. Um, and that's really about it. If somebody cheats, I can kick them out. Hopefully, we won't have nonsense like that. But here's, uh, see, there's already 10 extra credit projects to go along with these six, so you can totally make enough points here to make up for everything. All right. Um, and you will need to run virtual machines. Um, you can, uh, I'm assuming you're using Windows Server 2016. That's probably what you should all be using. Uh, so the first project is setting that thing up and getting DNS running on it. Um, some of the other projects actually use the old Windows Server 2008, which had interesting vulnerabilities, but I moved them down to the extra credit section because that's really not that important anymore. I don't think very many people are still using Windows Server 2008. And if they are, one, you're going to have to knock it off pretty soon. I think it's going to be at the end of life in a year or two. So realistically, these uh, weaknesses of that product are no longer too important. Anyway. Uh, so we have room for everybody. I already handed out ad codes and we'll have a break later when I can hand out some more. Um, anybody got any questions? Yeah. How do you find Windows 2016? Uh, you, you'll find in the first project, you can get a free copy from Microsoft. Um, I'm using a trial version. My Microsoft friend tells me I'm violating the license, but they haven't yelled at me yet. Um, <laughs> to use it for education. Um, there you can get a free six month trial and you can extend it six times, so it runs for three and a half years. So, and, if you, and after that, you just reinstall it and start again. So, uh, we actually, you do get free copies. By the way, in a few weeks, after the ad period, you'll all get added to you know, VMware Academy and Microsoft Academy. You get actual product keys for Microsoft software and for VMware software, but you don't really need them. <laughs> anyway, um, but I'll, I'll, you will, I will add you to that system uh, later, so you can have that stuff, but you won't really need it for this class. All right. Now, I wonder what this nonsense is. See if I can get this thing off the screen. Okay. So, let me bring up the, let's see, I already talked about the ad codes. Uh, let's just get this out of here. All right. Well, not that way. Right. What's going on with this thing? There we go. All right. So, here should be, by the way, all the slides are on my website. In addition to everything else, everything I use should be on my website. All right, so uh, let me start with this stuff. So we'll talk about that overview of what we're going to cover here. Um, everything you do on the internet uses DNS. Uh, occasionally, people hard code IP addresses into things like malware, but even malware can't really do that because you frequently move things to another address. And so almost everybody uses these alphabetical names, like ccsf.edu for everything, but you can't communicate on the internet with that kind of name. You can only communicate with a numerical IP address. So there has to be a master dictionary that converts alphabetic names into IP addresses. And that's distributed by DNS, and it turns out to be kind of a big mess. Um, so we'll talk about the attacks on DNS and uh, the vulner major vulnerabilities of it here. So um, DNS is essential for every company. If you have a company, you have a, a master top-level domain, and you have to have an authoritative domain server, and if that thing goes down, people can't reach the servers at your company. Now, they can for a while because they will have cached resolutions from the past, but after a while, those will expire, and then they won't be able to see your servers. So it is one way to take people down is to take down their DNS servers, and this has happened many times. In 2001, there was one that took out Microsoft's DNS servers, um, and this is because Microsoft in 2001, like I say this before Microsoft cared about security at all, and they did what most people did at that time. They just had one switch. And uh, that was the common way people did it. They just had one location serving up all the DNS, and if that one location could be brought down, that was the end of it. Um, so companies, this is one of the many kinds of attacks in the early parts of this millennium that convinced people to move to distributed architectures where you have many servers all over the place. So if one area goes down, another area will take over. So uh, here's a botnet in 2004 that caused another out outage with a lot of zombie PCs. This was one of the first uh, big distributed denial of service attacks, where it took over a large number of random machines and they all attacked at once from many locations so that even attempts to filter it by blocking bad IP addresses wouldn't work very well. 
In two, and the, then there's the crown jewel, which people have talked about many times. It was a big bone of contention in the days of WellSec and um, uh, Anonymous in 2011 and 2012. If you could take down the root DNS servers, they said you would take down the whole internet. And people have tried this several times. No one has ever succeeded. There are 13 root servers. They are actually server clusters. They are geographically distributed. They are using different operating systems. It is pretty heroic to take them down, and no one has ever come close. But here's one of the many attempts to do it with a 900 megabit per second flood in 2002. Um, this is one of the things that Hector Montague, the guy in uh, Lulsec, said he was going to do. He was going to use a packet amplification attack to take down the root of DNS. This is one of the things I argued with about him online before he was caught. Um, saying that you're talking nonsense and that wasn't going to work. Yeah. Lulsec? Yeah, Lulsec was the, um, first it was anonymous, which started out as a semi-political movement complaining about Scientology, and then they got involved in doing attacks on the internet, and then Lulsec was the uh, radical fringe of anonymous that decided to do vastly illegal things, and then they went into anti-sec, which was in fact an FBI um, sting operation run by Hector because they arrested him and they made him come back and let FBI agents run his machine and create a new one where they would commit international federal crimes so large that they could prosecute them for it. And uh, anyway, so for in 2011 and 2012, they did an enormous number of crimes all over the world and eventually they all got caught and they all made various kinds of plea bargains or they're rotting in jail. Um, but anyway, they did uh, also... One thing very, very common about cyber criminals is they brag. I think it's also true of the kind of criminals that walk around on the streets with guns. They brag a lot and pretend to be a lot more dangerous than they really are. And they often talk about how they have these exotic attacks and super powerful and everything. And it turns out the reality is quite more, a lot more modest. Anyway, so um, in, in 2002, this didn't have much effect because the DNS servers were over-provisioned, which means they were much more powerful than they needed to be. So routine traffic is not running at 50% capacity, or running at much less than 50%, so they can take a lot more. Um, and so here's a 2007 attack. Six root servers were attacked from Asia, but only two were affected. And this is because they didn't have any cast. Now, what's that? Okay. Now, there are four kinds of network traffic on the internet. There is um, multicast, <clears throat> anycast, unicast, and I don't remember the last one. Broadcast. broadcast. Yeah, broadcast. Thank you. So broadcast is where you have one source that goes to every machine it can get to. Uh, multicast is where you send a packet with a single address, and the switches on your network are aware of this, and they have sorted the devices into multicast groups, so certain devices get the traffic and other devices don't. It places quite a burden on the switches, and is very heavily used in IP version 6, and mainly used only for things like router updates, where you send a router update to a network, and you really only want that to go to the routers. It's, and so that you send it to a multicast group, which the routers join. Then there is unicast, which is where almost all traffic is, one source and one destination. And the last one is anycast, which is kind of nuts, Suppose I have a server like Google's DNS server at the address 8.8.8.8. If I have one server and all the world is going to 8.8.8.8, that means there's one point of attack. It also means people, if that's in Sunnyvale, people far away like Asia have a really long delay getting to it. So if you really want to serve that up, you put servers all over the world and you give them all the same IP address. So there's an 8.8.8.8 in China and one in Japan and one in Britain and one in Africa and just everywhere. And wherever you are, that's called Anycast. There are many servers with the same address, all advertised in Border Gateway Protocol, so that wherever you are, you will find the closest 8.8.8. .8. That's Anycast. I will settle for any of the 8.8.8 .8 servers. This is a very good idea. Then if one of them goes down, it will cease being advertised in Border Gateway Protocol, and the packets will just find the next nearest one. So that's a very good way to protect yourself. Cloudflare does this extensively, and they protect more than 10% of the entire web from attack with it. And most of the DNS routes were using this technique at this time, and now I think they all do, because it means you cannot even attack one server. If you start trying to attack one server, all you can do is attack one IP address, and the structure of the Internet will spontaneously spread that across many, um, many servers, so you can only take it down if you can take them all down. 
Yes, it's not intentionally built in as load balancing. It's a geographic of load balancing. It works as load balancing, essentially. It's, it's not exactly like um, equal. It's not um, balanced load balancing, but it is um, sort of like the round robin load balancing. It's, it's a proc, but it does mean that you can't really focus on one device. Your attack will spontaneously smear around. Wow. All right. And I bet if I knew how to operate this software, there would be somebody to get this junk to get popping up on my screen, but I don't know what I have to do to make that happen. Anyway, all right. Um, Zoom is very nice for the customers, but it does pop up a lot of junk on my screen. All right, so here's here's a traffic pattern of that. They, they attacked a lot of DNS servers, but they didn't manage to bring them all down. And so uh, we should talk about how DNS works. So if I down, I'm down here and I want to reach something at the City College domain, then I want to go to the authoritative name server at um, City College. So if I type in something like www.ccsf.edu, my browser, and my, I have a brand new, I just restarted my router and I haven't been using it at all for a whole day. The first thing it has to do is go to the root of the entire network and find out where .com is, or .edu in this case. The root server only has 13 records, and those are where the top-level domains are. Although, I wonder if it's more now that we have all these new top-level domains, but originally it was 13. So this tells me where the EDU top-level domain servers are. That's all the root has. Now I ask the EDU top-level domain, where is ccsf.edu? And they tell me where that server is, and they send me to the authoritative server here, which can now tell me if there is something called www.ccsf.edu or not. So it may take three or four queries to resolve this at different levels, although in practice, you've almost always got the top levels cached. Your machine remembers to the past where .com is and maybe where ccsf.edu is, um, so it saves you some time. You can use uh, Dig. Dig is the most valuable tool to do this. It's not built in natively on Windows, but you can add it, and it's in on Linux and the Mac. So if you do a dig, ccsf.edu plus trace, then it will do the whole path. Instead of just finding the local copy that's easiest to reach, which is what it normally does. So here it does going up to the root, getting the 13 root servers. Then it asks the root server where edu is. Then it asks edu where ccsf.edu is to find the name server, and then it gets an answer of where CCSF is. So this is the hierarchical layer, and at every layer, things are cached and held for a long time, so you don't keep asking the higher layer the same stupid question over and over and over. Which has two effects. It makes resolution faster, it makes it cheaper at every level, and it also means there's a high chance that the information you're getting is out of date because it was cached at different levels, and that's why you configure this time here, which is how long it will be before it refreshes. If you make the time of your records long, then your server will not have to have as much traffic because people will ask you less frequently to refresh the data, but it also means if you have to change it, it'll take a long time for the change to percolate. So those are your choices. All right, so that's caching. Like I say, our resolver servers cache things, so if I have a bunch of clients on the same network and they're all going to the same website, it just caches it locally and doesn't bother asking anybody where it is. It says, I already know where that is. I'll just tell you what I told the last guy until that counter time's down and I decide it's time to refresh this information because it might have changed. So this means uh, one big DNS attack is you can poison the cache. One enormous problem with DNS is almost all this traffic is plain text and is completely unauthenticated. It's not encrypted, there's no password, there's no signature. So suppose this cache expires and I ask some server, uh, is ccsf.edu still there? Or is edu still there? I could lie and give it a false answer and it wouldn't be able to tell I was lying because the real answer doesn't come in with a good authentication scheme. So you can often poison the cache by sending it a fake update, which you can't tell from real update. And if you do that, then you'll affect a region of people, like all the people at one network or all the people at one internet service provider. Not the whole internet, but some large region of people will get the wrong answer for things for a period of time. And there have been a lot of these. Um, cache poisoning is a good one. This is a one way, you know, you already know the phishing where you send people an email and you have a link which looks like their bank, but it isn't. When they click on it, they go to a fake bank website. But you could do this. You could poison the Comcast DNS resolver with the wrong IP address for the bank site, and now all the customers who did not click on a link and don't have any malware will still go to the wrong page, and you get their credit card numbers, and that's what was going on here, a farming attack. Uh, phishing 
is where you have a link. When they click on it, you get money. Farming is more indirect, like planting seeds. You poison the cash on a server. That doesn't directly get you any money, but it means later some people will probably wander through and you'll get money then. So Dan Kaminsky here, one of the most famous hackers in the world and uh, greatly beloved. He's a very nice guy. He's one of the smartest people in security by far. And he's also one of the nicest. I never hear him say anything mean about anybody and nobody's mad at him except people that are jealous. They're funny of them. But anyway, he, um, he found a serious vulnerability in, all, in the DNS fundamental protocol in 2008. And unlike most of the vulnerabilities, this was not a bug. It was not a mistake. It was a fundamental design flaw in DNS. He just bothered to understand DNS better than anybody else in the world at that time. And he realized that just by obeying the official rules of DNS, you could poison caches. And therefore, he could reroute traffic on a large scale anywhere he wanted to. And he was influential enough to arrange secret meetings with all the stakeholders like Microsoft and the other big companies and get it secretly fixed before it became public, which is very hard to do. I've disclosed hundreds of vulnerabilities, none this important, and I can almost never get anybody to pay attention at all. Um, and most, most people in the business share this frustration with me. We just dump it out publicly because nobody cares. Um, only a few people actually have the connections and the importance to actually get people like Microsoft to listen to you and come through them. Although it says Microsoft now is much more receptive. When I found a vulnerability in Microsoft to report to them, I asked my friends and they put me in contact with the Microsoft security team within three days. I had a very clear answer. They said, we don't care. We're not going to patch it, which is not, which is not the answer I wanted, but I did reach the right people and I did get an answer. So I spent the next three years humiliating the hell out of them until they passed it. But, um, but at least I wasn't like doing this in a rogue way uh, without their blessing. When people tell me, we don't care, I say, you volunteered to be homework. That's what you did. <laughs> like giving give your students your homework, did it at DEF CON. Well, they don't care. Gee, this must be fine. I'll do it everywhere then. I, they said it's fine. Doesn't look fine to me, but they say this is fine. I love it when people do that. Yeah. Um, well, I would like to say zero. That's a very good question. You get in trouble for doing your homework. I try to make sure all your homework is legal. Um, I have failed a couple times. I found out. <laughs> I, I found out. I, I, in this class, well, no, in the first place, I'm the one at fault. If you do anything bad, you say, I told you to do it and blame it on me, and they'll come yell at me. And it was just, but um, realistically, this particular class is really quite safe because you're just going to use your own servers. You're not going to be attacking anything on the internet. In my CISSP class, my students often do find real vulnerabilities in the real world, and that's where people get mad at you. And um, I, but nothing you're doing here is dangerous. However, if you proceed in this business, you will almost undoubtedly discover real vulnerabilities in the real world. And I must say, this is what the experts told me right from the start. They say, if you find a vulnerability on somebody's website, in somebody's product, then the correct professional response is to do nothing and let them get hacked. That is the right thing to do. This is like, I remember there was a time before they had Good Samaritan laws where they said, if you're a doctor driving down the street, you see a traffic accident, some poor guy's bleeding to death, just look the other way and keep driving because if you try to save him, they'll blame you when he dies. And that is the way it is. If you try to help somebody, you're just volunteering to be prosecuted and abused. Now, I can't stand doing that. And I'm just a natural troublemaker anyway, so I tell them anyway. But all you do by telling them is call a world of abuse on your head. And the chance of them fixing it from hundreds of trials is like 2%. Yeah? So what's the difference between bug bounties? Bug bounties are the exception. Bug bounties are a controlled way where they promise to actually pay you money or give you some kind of reward and not prosecute you. And if you stay within the rules, you can earn some money that way. So that's certainly an option. You can try to earn bug bounties. Uh, that is probably, if you really want to do this stuff, that is the best way to do it. Do you go to, a bug bounty or no, you have to go to some company that has joined a bug bounty program. But they're becoming more popular now because the Department of Defense did it twice. And that got people's attention and Microsoft did it. So now the larger companies are sort of wising up. And if you go to um, uh, one of the big ones like HackerOne and the other ones, there are, there, are, um, there are programs you can join and you can look for bugs there. I've, I've, and I have made a few hundred bucks doing that, actually. I went to one of them, I submitted a whole bunch of DNS vulnerabilities, and nobody cared. And like three years later, one of them said, hey, this is pretty cool. And they sent me some money. Anyway, so, <laughs> and, but anyway, I, I never do the fashionable stuff. If you want to really make money, the stuff they really want 
is they want you to go to their website and find something about the cookie that lets you go right into somebody else's account. That they will pay, you pay money for right away. <laughs> All of mine are like too esoteric. I said your DNS zones could easily be spoofed and they could hack into you and they didn't really understand that. And I say, you know, you're using plain text authentication, you should encrypt it and they don't really care about that. And I do unfashionable things. But what they what they people are really pay you for is like what happens to Facebook, where they that one Facebook had a password reset link that had a long random number, but that random number was also used to tag an image on Facebook. So you could go to someone's page and figure out that number and then reset their password and totally get in their account. And they paid money for that. That they understand. That will get their attention. Anything more complicated and easy to they'll just say, Oh, we don't care, it's not in scope. This is like Johnny Christmas at Hope Convention like a month ago was saying, so I do penetration tests on these companies. And so I tell, I'll just send phishing emails. I totally get in. So now the companies say, we know we're vulnerable to phishing, so no more phishing. He said, but are you going to fix it? They say, no, that's too much bother. And you're like, well, why am I doing this at all? Then? <laughs> You've got a big hole. You know it's broken. You're not going to fix it. Why am I doing this? <laughs> well, I know one guy that actually um, – was a pen tester for years and he finally just quit and quit the whole security company the last few talks he gave were like penetration testing is stupid <laughs> there's a sort of lack of uh, job satisfaction he said i do a pen test in the company report a bunch of stuff next year i'd come back and they have the same holes then next year i come back and they have the same holes and i'm like why am i doing this but anyway um it is if you get into management and defense which i'm a little bit closer to you begin to understand this it is a real pain to fix certain problems anyway Anyway, so, but vulnerable disclosure is a huge, interesting topic. And uh, they had a whole lot about it at uh, B-Sides in Las Vegas. They had the I'm the Cavalry Room and a lot of vulnerable disclosure talks there from lawyers and all kinds of people, journalists and everybody talking about the many issues here. Um, anyway, DNS Changer is a similar one. DNS Changer is malware that infects your machine and changes your DNS address and nothing else. Doesn't steal your password, doesn't put the machine under remote control, it just changes the address of your DNS server to one the attacker controls. Now the attacker can change the records on that to lie to you about certain things like your bank. And later on you go to your bank, you're going to the wrong address, it's another cute one. This one was pretty impressive because it infected a large number of machines and most people that were infected did not know it and they were using the criminal servers. And so the FBI busted the criminals and they didn't want to take down the server because everybody would get kicked off the internet. So they had like public service announcements and warnings saying, please run a virus scan, clean off DNS changer. And then they were, had to get apply for legal permission and funding to keep the fake server up longer so those people stayed on the internet. It was a big issue. <laughs> it's, uh, this is, like a lot of things, this is a problem. People. Most end users just have no idea what's going on. They don't know what DNS is. They don't know they're infected. They're, they're just helpless. And do you want to just abandon them, kick them off the internet? Or do you want to try to give them a crutch to lean on for a while? And if so, who pays for it? A lot of issues come up like this. Another big one is Microsoft. Microsoft, um, there's a whole lot of researchers in Europe primarily and large antivirus companies that uh, take malware samples then they analyze them with the malware analysis techniques we're teaching you here and better ones. They find the command and control server. They take over the botnet. You can easily do this. If the, the malware has a, a programmed semi-random number generator generating addresses for the botnet. So if you can look at what the addresses are going to be tomorrow and buy those domains, you can take over the botnet by taking over the address that it's going to phone home to. So now you own a botnet. Now what do you do? It's probably illegal to do anything with it, but technically the bad guys don't have it anymore. So researchers would take them over and then try to like do queries to see how many machines are infected and try to see how various patches are cleaning it off and things like that. Well, then Microsoft stormed in like the elephant in the room, started doing this work as usual, kind of late after a lot of people were already in it. They started taking them offline. They would go to court orders and get permission to take down servers and clean off the malware. And so the first bunch they cleaned off were in fact other researchers that had already taken over the bottom. And and they're crying foul, and Microsoft's saying, well, how was I supposed to know? And there's a whole lot of this. In botnet work and anti-spam work, there are a lot of people that keep on attacking each other and undoing each other's work and blaming each other. And a good portion of them claim that the other guys are actually crooks, and some of them probably are crooks. You know, it's, it's sort of like the rival mafia gangs. Anyway, so it's kind of madness. Anyway, I got some cahoots. These are actually up. Last night's cahoots were not there, but these are up. I checked. So... Um, if you have a computer, you should bring a computer or a cell phone or something if you want to do this. This is optional and worth extra credit, but it tends to keep people from falling asleep. So, and you can do it remotely. So, CNET 40. These are just review questions, but I do have to spell CNET right or it doesn't work. Okay. 
Chapter 1A is here. All right. It will come up in just a sec. There. Uh, it will pop up. It's kahoot.it. There you are, kahoot.it, and then you type in that number. And uh, these are worth extra credit if you get the most right. The top three scorers get three points. And it can add up to a bit after a while. It's not a whole lot, but the main point is it's uh, oh, keep you, you just put in a name, yeah. You don't need a password or anything. And you can put an if you use some kind of fake name and you win, you will have to tell me your real name or you won't get your form. Last, last class I was teaching, somebody logged in as like Dark Shadow or something, then went home and they didn't get their points yet. They're going to have to tell me who the heck they are. Anyway, so this is, uh, oh good, here come some people. This is CNET 40. Cahoots. No, just go to Kahoot.it and then join this. You just need that pin game number. Okay. Six nine six that number there. Um, okay, this is uh, eight twenty two eighteen. All right, and you are rated both on accuracy and on speed. So even if you get them all right, you might still not win because you're not the fastest. This is uh, this is this thing's quite popular among like uh, teenagers and gamers and stuff. Anyway, so. So I'll wait a bit. I think we probably have more than 24 coming. Yep, here they are, still coming. Good. I, you, your name should be scrolling by. After a while, I get people doing uh, ASCII art and Japanese names and stuff. So far, <laughs> you some of them can do pretty exotic things. There's drawing little faces and pictures and stuff. Yeah, the, uh, well, I guess some of them look like Unicode to me. I, I, I don't. Well, there is two byte and four byte Unicode, but I don't know exactly how much of it. Yeah, long ago. Yeah, but I, I, there is def, definitely. I know I've seen Japanese and Chinese up there, and for that you need two bytes. But it might support longer ones too. Oh yeah, because it's a modern world. I mean, you gotta. English is not the whole story anymore. Uh, it doesn't come up very much here, but uh, it certainly is. There's a there are some attacks. This is one of the many ways to make a domain that looks like the right domain, but it isn't. There are letters that will be interpreted as a by many browsers, even if they're not an A. That's certainly an issue. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Different browsers handle it differently. And there have been, uh, Microsoft, in fact, um, was so vulnerable one of these attacks about three years ago, they actually eliminated support for all European languages for like two months to work around, which is pretty rude mm -hmm. to the people in Europe. But there was a, there was proving PayPal with like a A with an umlaut or something. It was just looked like an A. Huh? And Microsoft's quick workaround was to just end all support for non-American non alphabets, <laughs> which is, this is, this does solve the problem in one sense, but it creates another problem. Right now we have a similar issue because of the general data protection regulation in Europe, which is so burdensome, a bunch of companies are now blocking Europe from the website because they don't want to comply with the European law. I don't think that's going to work for long, but anyway, I guess uh, five more seconds and I'll go. All right, so. All right, smartphone. I don't know why I'm even asking this. All right. <laughs> I should have looked. This one, I obviously you do. Well, yeah, yeah. That's, I think I'm going to. I don't know why that's there. Hopefully, I don't have too many stupid ones. Um, <laughs> this, I think this might be the. <laughs> this might be the very first class I ever used Kahoot in, and I had a few questions the first time. Obviously, you have something. Or anyway. Okay, here we are. Okay, which crypto system requires a secure key distribution channel? That's interesting. I'm wondering if these are the wrong cahoots. Let me, let me, uh, I'll let this one go. This is certainly something you should know, but it's not really related to this class. Um, CNET 40. All right. Uh, <clears throat> 
Let me uh, turn off my projector for a minute and check my cahoots. I seem to have something fouled up about my cahoots. It was 141. Was it 141? Oh, it was. Oh, good. Thank you. Then I feel better. All right, good. Let's try this again. That made a lot more sense if it's 141. I thought the 40s were a little smarter than that. Seen at 40. There. Okay. Good. Thank you. Seen at 40 is better. 141 is the cryptography class. You will have to rejoin with a different number. Try this. Let's see if this is less stupid. <laughs> it's a prettier number anyway. Yeah, that was good. All right. Well, all right, now I know there's something like 43 students, so I have an idea when we're there. Ah, there's some ASCII art. Good. Happy kid, I think. There is a guy. There's a guy that draws that in San Francisco everywhere. At least he used to. I don't know if he's still doing it. Kilroy, yeah. Yeah, there's Kilroy everywhere. I haven't seen that lately. I used to see him around the campus. I don't know if he's still doing it. Shim. Oh, wow, well, there you go. So you can get some of those things, those, uh, whatever those, uh, wing dings, I guess. Probably. All right, I'll give it another 10 seconds. Looks like five people already fell asleep. Ah, oh, good, not quite. All right. All right, I think we got enough. Let's see if the questions are less stupid. She at 40, that's the right class. That's a good start. Okay, yeah, which attack made Dan Kaminsky famous? There you go. That was actually in the lecture, so. A lot less stupid than the last one. All right, there was cash poisoning, and we will be playing with it later. All right, so what would an end user notice if your local DNS resolver went down for an hour? That's what people were talking about in 2012. Didn't it happen? Well, in my opinion, it happened in 2016, but it did not happen at that time. Huh? I was thinking the last election. But anyway, the, uh, all right. um, so uh, that's right. The whole internet will be unavailable if your local resolver doesn't work. That's like your router going down. You're not going to be able to get anywhere. All right. If the root servers go down for an hour, what would happen? <laughs> well, some people, some people, Imagine that there is something you can do other than the internet in life. There's some weird people like that out there. There aren't very many of them around here, but there are some people like that. All right, and so this would have no perceivable effect because all kinds of caches remember it. So most people would just use the cached addresses from the top level and never notice and for many hours that anything was wrong. All right, so what protocol does DNS use to communicate? Just basic net plus stuff. Hopefully you know it. If not, you're going to learn it. All right. He uses UDP almost all the time. Does not use TCP. UDP, the simplest packets, is what almost all DNS resolutions are done with. Um, It's, it's, their TCP is used for zone transfers, and TCP is used for some extensions for large records. But most of it is still UDP. No, UDP is an alternative to TCP. It's much simpler. TCP has a handshake, so you make sure the destination is listening. UDP is just like the post office. You just mail it without knowing where it's going or carrying. It's, yeah, so UDP is a simpler, faster protocol, and that was designed to make DNS fast, 
to get high performance at the cost of accuracy. All right, how many DNS root servers are there? All right, there are 13 names. Each one of them actually points to clusters, but they call it the 13 servers. It's a single server in the same sense that like Google.com is it's actually a cluster, but you're getting at with one name. All right, uh, what port does DNS use? I'm gonna get it. Another net plus question. Okay, 53 is DNS. 80 is HTTP, is HTTPS. 53 is DNS. All right. All right, how many servers will you query if you do that command? Dig www.ccsf.edu. Normally just one. You ask your local resolver and almost always it has the answer. Um, so the norm, most of your queries go no further than one hop because you have had some other traffic to a similar domain recently that remembers it's in the cache uh, on your local resolver. How many will be queried by that command? Plus trace. Okay, uh, that'll be four is the best answer here. Uh, it could possibly be three, but anyway, that's um. Why are there two fours? <laughs> <laughs> well, whoever idiot made these things, that obviously needs some work. By the way, th this is partly why it's extra credit because there are mistakes. Anyway, um, so uh, I'll make a note. Yes, but I can't fix it now, especially in this system. So anyway. Uh, in my, that's why I make this extra credit, I make some M dot, I know who that is, then there's more coming later. Richard will have to tell me a little more information, and Sempain, that's, Sempain will have to tell me who they are at some point. <laughs> All right, what's that? You're feeling what? I'm Richard. Richard, good, okay. All right, good, I'll tell me your last name at some point. But anyway, all right, so, um, all right. So let me just take a look at where we are. Uh, we got, I um, well, let me do a little bit more of this. We'll take a break when we hit, get, I think, up to the hour. I don't want to make it sit any longer than that. But we'll finish. All right. So then there's DNS assisting other attacks. This was the big one that hit the news about a year or two ago. Um, WannaCry was ransomware. Uh, it was a big attack. It was the number one money maker from about six months ago to about two years ago um, because people didn't know how to block it. It's actually very easy to block if you know what to look for, but a lot of people weren't ready for it. So WannaCry brought down a whole bunch of hospitals in England. Uh, by infecting them and demanding ransom to decrypt the files. And it would have brought down hospitals in America, except for um, this guy who bought the domain and froze it. So it didn't take him over. And then they were arrested him. He's still in America. Malware check is his Twitter handle. Hutchins, I think, is his name. He's still running around being accused of a previous crime by the FBI and chased around and going to court and stuff. And a bunch of people think he's a hero and you should let him off. But anyway, um, this, this was a lot of people, as always happens, whenever something bad of this magnitude happens, everyone starts blaming everybody else. Um, they want to cry, used NSA malware to infect the box. Now, the NSA develops the worst malware in the world. They find, they buy up all the zero days they can, they pay a ton of money for them, and they keep them secret so they don't get patched. And a lot of people criticize them for that and say you should tell the vendors so they patch them. But the NSA says, look, we're here to spy on all the communication. We need those zero days. They're military weapons. We're not going to reveal them. And unfortunately, they don't protect them very well. So the Russians stole them. Then the Russians dumped them publicly. 
And they tried to pretend it was somebody else, Guccifer and Guccifer too, and tried to pretend this guy was like Ukrainian or something, but it was, it was really just the Russians, the KGB, trying to humiliate the NSA and doing a pretty good job at it with really impressive malware. We all got a bunch of awesome attacks out of there. I've been using eternal romance in the advanced hacking classes. Those NSA attacks are really the catch me out. Man, they really hack things well. So, yeah. Yes. If you if you discover a significant vulnerability, um, you can get a million bucks for it. Like if you have if you can take over a modern iPhone through the browser, you can get a million bucks for that easy. And there are about an eight or ten uh, zero day brokers that will help you negotiate, like an agent for a, an actor, to get more money. And you'll sell to somebody. Now some of them will just sell to anybody, and some of them will only sell to NATO members. They have various degrees of ethics. But the scuttlebutt I hear is that the NSA is the main purchaser and the moment the most money. So you'll probably be ending up selling back to the NSA, which is why there hasn't been a new um, public iPhone jailbreak for a while, though I think there might be a couple now. But in general, iPhone jailbreaks are now worth too much money to just dump them openly. Anyway, yeah. Anyway, so I'm, um, all right. Oh, well, well, sure. As a matter of fact, no, as a matter of fact, I had a student who developed a new iPhone jailbreak, and I gave him credit for a whole classroom. And I was actually going to a, a council uh, meeting of the city college committee, and I said, you're offering, why don't you teach this new class? And they said, you didn't say how many homework projects they have to do. And I said, well, it depends on what they do. And they said, well, you wouldn't let them just do one. And I said, well, as a matter of fact, <laughs> this guy did one project. I think he gave him credit for three whole classes for that. I said, that's bloody awesome. <laughs> Sure, if you, if you write a zero day, you make a million bucks. In case you care, I'll give you a bunch of points. Uh, <laughs> but I think, anyway, so this is the guy, Malware Tech, that uh, he bought, what he did is just what everybody did. He got a sample of the malware. He went through and found the domain name in there that was calling, and he just found that the domain name hadn't been bought. So he bought the domain name, thinking, well, let's see what traffic comes in. And he hadn't figured it out that much, but it turned out that just that domain name being registered stopped it from spreading. And so by accident, he knew, defanged it, and this was in the time zone when Europe was all infected. And when the time zone came around to business time in America, nobody got infected because he had turned it off by accident. And, um, I didn't know it was by accident. Well, he admitted it. I mean, he said, like, I didn't, I didn't figure out exactly how it worked. I, just, I didn't know what would happen, but I saw this domain name, and I said, hey, why don't I buy that and see what that would do? And hey, now it doesn't spread anymore. That's kind of weird. That's a pretty weird way to write malware, but that's how they wrote it. They apparently had an off switch, and that was the off switch. So if he said I did it, he must have like stopped it. They might have thought it was more of a zero. Uh, I suppose, but he would have to fool. He would actually have to explain how he figured it out and convince us that he really could have figured it out. Um, I think. Um, by the way, if you if that seems screwy, there's another system more familiar to us that is equally screwy, known as Bart. One of the guys I know was a penetration tester. He gave talks here a couple of times, and he did a penetration test on Bart. BART paid, our, our subway system here, they, above ground light rail, they paid for a penetration test, so they brought him in, and he was in there, gave him a, a place to work, hooked him in a network, and he was like scanning the network, finding servers, guessing passwords, looking for vulnerabilities, and he found this IP address in the BART network. He connected with Telnet, and it just said one. Nothing else, no prompt, no nothing. Type one, it says one. Type zero, it says zero. <laughs> no clue, so he went on, and he goes on doing something else then, Half an hour later, just not popping a door. Bang, bang, bang. Oh, what are you doing in there? Well, I'm doing the pen test. Uh, right now, I'm in an email server trying to get you know, Have you been to this address? He said, yeah, I was there, but there was nothing there, so I went on. Okay, must not be you. They left. Next day, the Chronicle's front page headline, Bart out for three hours because of computer problem. <laughs> that was the master switch for Bart. One means the trains run. Zero means the trains stop. That was it. No password, no prompt, no nothing. That was the master on-off switch for Bart. <laughs> and, and, you know, this one all the results of his pen test. Oh, uh, gosh. You should, like, put a password on that or something. <laughs> anyway, um, he, said, he said, this is something every pen tester lives for. You can go home, have the headline newspaper. It was me. That was me. I did that. I did that. I created a global catastrophe. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so. Yeah, well, that's, well, of course. And just like this guy, he can't say, I figured out how to turn off Bart because I'm a super villain. Hell no, I'm just poking at things. And <laughs> anyway. So um, that's the plane. A lot of argument about whether Hutchins is a good guy or a bad guy. Um, he's still trapped in America. He's out on bail. He can't have a job. He's no. They didn't punish him for that. Apparently, before this, he wrote like some malware 
that was used by somebody to make a botnet and they claim he was like selling it and making money, but he claims he wasn't and the lawyers are defending and now, you know, there's a huge controversy. The government's accusing, claiming that he did something years before that was illegal. He's saying he didn't and it's very unclear. Whether it was for like bank software yeah. or something like that. Thank you, yes. Oh, okay. So he got, like, yeah, he sold like a rat, right? Yeah. Yeah. That, a lot of people sell rats, remote access Trojans, and they have, and it's been, uh, Poison Ivy was a commercial product for years, a very popular rat. A lot of people design remote access products and sell them to people, which are then used for crimes, and it's not clear whether that's really your fault or not. It's like you sell people guns and they do a crime. Is it really your fault or not? And the answer is not so simple. Also, I think he's like under like he's like 21 now, so like when he did that, he was probably 17 years old. That's true. Yeah, so well, anyway, he came to America to go to DEF CON, and so they got him. If he'd stayed like wherever he was, I think Britain, he would have been fine. Britain has much lighter penalties to these guys. He's just facing court. He's not facing yeah, but he's been, sort of, he's been sort of trapped here for a year. He used DEF CON again. He has a, you can contact him on Twitter and see what he's up to. He's wandering around. Various people are supporting him. He's, he's out, but he's still waiting for court dates and stuff. Yeah. Right, neither can he, but EFF is, is saving him. If you haven't given any money to EFF, you should. EFF is a San Francisco-based charity. They're the ACLU for the Internet, and they really are super important these days. The government is really pushing too hard. They're the closest thing you have to anybody like protecting normal people on the Internet. Anyway, um, then there's dynamic DNS. Now, this allows you to change an IP, a domain name quickly. Um, so another thing it will do is let you host a machine on a temporary IP address. Normally, you cannot host a website on a home internet connection because your IP address changes every time you reconnect, so they can't find you. But there are proxies that will take the traffic and find you wherever you are and redirect the traffic to you, and those are dynamic DNS sites. And this is what some people do to sort of subvert the terms of service of their internet connection contract and run servers from a home network connection that is not really designed for that. It technically violates the contract, probably, and of course, the other thing about it is it won't really be able to handle too much traffic before you'll have to. So, you know, it's, it's kind of thing small people do with small websites that not too many people go to, sort of in the spirit of the old BBSs. A major company can't get away with this kind of stuff. Um, fast Flux DNS is another system to change. What's that? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, you do. Um, but uh, so one reason, this is a type of DNS, um, yes, right. So, well, this is what malware people do a lot. They'll take over a server, use it to host like a, uh, a phishing page, then they'll get caught, so they'll just move it to another and another and try to change it rapidly as fast as the ground burns out underneath them. And that's why they'd want short cache times and the ability to change the record rapidly. Now, you do have to pay a fee to change a major DNS record. So um, you need the cooperation of a name service provider or you need to be paying with a stolen credit card or something, which they do. Uh, all right. And uh, there's fast flux DNS is another to hide your servers behind proxies that rapidly change so it's hard to find the server. Um, and Cloudflare does this not for this purpose, but it has a similar effect. If you use Cloudflare, nobody can find your server because they're only seeing copies of your page on the Cloudflare servers and they never can send any traffic directly to your server at all, which protects you from DOS attacks and it also means they can't find where you are at all to take you down or whatever they want to do to you. Um, and then there's packet amplification, and after this we'll take a 10 minute break. But this is the packet amplification is a big deal. There are many different versions of it. It keeps coming back. Um, there are ways, if you can have an internet connection that's maybe 10 megabits per second or 100 megabits per second, there are ways to multiply your traffic so you hit a server with much more than that. The earliest, simplest one was the Smurf attack, where the attacker would send broadcast pings. This is what caused the internet protocols to be readjusted to block directed broadcast. So let me just point this out. Um, if I bring up my local connection here, okay, and do uh, ifconfig en0, here's my wireless adapter. Okay, so here I am on City College Network, and um, my internet address is here, 147.144.201.165. And my subnet mask is 255.255.240. This is a super native network halfway between class C and class B. So it has a uh, slice 20. Oh, uh, wait. Yeah, slice 20. And so here's the broadcast address. So I have two kinds of broadcasts. Here's the, the undirected broadcast. 
Okay, oh, it's working. This is just like, okay, this is the undirected broadcast. You ping 255, 255, 255, 255. And occasionally they remember to turn on isolation. About half the time they have it on, the other half of the time it's off. There's something old, some screws loose in the network around here. But the isolation appears to be off. So when I ping the undirected broadcast, I go to the local router and I go to everybody that's connected to the local router. And all the Windows machines don't answer because Microsoft blocked this about 10 years ago on Windows. But these are all the Macs, like your Macs, all the Macs of students around here answering my ping. I send one ping and I get a whole bunch of answers here, maybe 20 or 30. Only the Macs and only the Linux and Linux machines and um, probably the iPhones, anything running Unix or Linux, but not Windows machines in their default configuration that will not answer pings anymore. Android probably answered. Anyway, so these are, these are all answering me. So what one packet turned into many. Now I can do this on my local network and it works, but I can't, you used to be able to do it from a distance. You could do it from anywhere off campus with this address. This is called the directed broadcast. You'd ping that address and it would route over the internet to the target and then hit everything there. And then they would all reply. And that was the Smurf attack because it was, um, all the attacker had to do was find somebody with a lot of computers, no much, not much security, like say City College, and then if they want to attack somebody like Target, they will attack, send pings to the City College network, which will then ping all these devices, so every one ping will turn into a thousand responses, and they forge the from address to equal their target. So all the replies go down here. Now this has the effect that if I am sending one million packets per second here, they're going to get hit by a hundred million packets down here. It also has the effect that when these people figure out they're under attack and try to stop it, they're going to say, who's attacking me? City College is attacking me. There's, this guy's address is nowhere in the package. So they're going to blame this guy and yell at them. And these guys are say, what are you doing? What are you talking about? Um, and on it goes. That was, that's the joy of packet amplification. And um, there's this particular attack was stopped by changing the internet protocols. So broadcast, directed broadcasts are no longer forwarded by the internet routers. So you cannot send a broadcast packet from off campus. Um, that lowers the damage here, although I could still do it on campus to attack somebody in this room. I didn't routers, routers attached, attached to the internet. Uh, routers outside your local network. Yeah. Routers that handle border gateway control and go any suggestions. So um, those, those are the backbone routers, if you want to call them that. The ones that so lift you off. Probably over the ISP. Yeah, yeah, telcos, yeah. And so the protocols out there no longer forward these directed broadcasts. Yeah, anyway, but uh, there are many other packet amplification attacks using many other protocols that are still out there. NTP is one of the big ones, and there's a bunch of others. There's a bunch of protocols that take a small request and have a big response, and if they run over UDP, then you can lie in the address. If they run over TCP, this doesn't work because you have to complete the handshake. But UDP, there's one of the huge problems at UDP, you can forge the from address and it will still work because it has no handshake. So this is why DNS is one of the many things that is, that is used for packet amplification. You can have a small DNS request with a big DNS response, and since it's running over UDP, you can forge the from address and let the responses all go to your victim, and it has the same effect. They get hit with a bunch of traffic, and they can't tell where it came from. So it is a problem, and one solution is to use TCP instead, but TCP is much more expensive, so it would slow everything down. So there are many arguments about what to do. Anyway, we're up to seven. Let's take a break until 10 after seven just so people can stretch your legs. We'll come back and do some more of this. I'm not going to go lecturing until nine, but we'll do about another half hour or so. And I'm going to pause the recording. Okay. All right. So, all right. So like I say, DNS amplification will work too. You find a domain where a small request gives you a big answer. And you can get applications up to about a factor of 50. Um, and this is called distributed reflected DOS, DR DOS. Uh, so, for example, dig any at yahoo.com. This says, I want all the information I can get about Yahoo. And so the query is relatively small, and the answer is very big with many facts in it. And it's just a UDP request that has a large UDP reply. That's all that matters for purposes of a DOS attack. And so you can view it in Wireshark, and you'll see the query was 69 bytes and the answer was 379 bytes. So you're able to amplify by what's that, about a factor of five. So that's a start, 5.5 times. 
Um, if you dig IETF.org, you'll get an even larger response because IETF is the Internet Engineering Task Force, and they are people that verify the protocols, and so they're using the modern enhanced protocols, and they have these long cryptographic signatures on the records because this is DNSSEC, which we're going to cover more as we go ahead. There is a new protocol in its infancy, only used by the most technically advanced people now, which adds encryption signatures to things, so you actually know who's talking to you, and one of the results is to make the DNS replies much bigger. And so here, um, the, the query was that small, and the answer was that big, so 28 bytes turned into 4,000 bytes. So that's a multiplication of 45 times. But this had to go over TCP, so it can't be used for the usual kind of DR-DOS attack because you have to complete the handshake so you can't redirect the result to a third party. All right, now uh, it turns out because of DNSSEC, the results are very big. For some unknown reason, the original DNS protocol used was designed to use UDP and it limited the, the data transmission field to a maximum of 512 bytes which doesn't make much sense to me because a UDP packet can carry 65,000 bytes, but the DNS protocol only lets you use 512. And 512 is big enough in the old days, but it's really not big enough for those cryptographic signatures. So there are various extension options, and eDNS does it here by just extending the UDP packet up 4,096 bytes, which is fine, but that will make DNS amplification much more powerful because it's still going over UDP. Uh, you can also use DNS... Um, as a conduit of attacks, it can be used to, uh, one of the common things DNS is used for is to exfiltrate data. You have long domain names in fake DNS queries, which are used to sneak encrypted data out of a network somewhat covertly. And um, here's another one. Uh, and you can detect infections by monitoring DNS. You can also, I've had, uh, remember several years ago when I was teaching uh, network server administration um, and a student came to me and said, I'm the server admin, and someone in my company is doing forbidden things on the internet, and how do I catch them? And I said, easy as pie, you just record DNS, you'll see them going to the forbidden domain, it'll tell you what time, it'll tell you their IP address, it's, it's a built-in spying on everybody. <laughs> um, and uh, this, if you use OpenDNS, they will let you have a service where you use their DNS servers, and you can even tell them the IP addresses of your workers and your product, your security protocols and they will filter it and they will tell you who's trying to go to the bad place and stuff. They'll block out known malware hosting domains and anything else you want to block out, games, porn, whatever you'd like. Um, so, you know, you, but it's, this means everything you do is not private at all. It's being sent to the DNS server in plain text and anybody can monitor it. You can do it with just about four lines of Python. So, Configure was one of the botnets that went out there and it made 50,000 new domains a day, but you could take your sample of the malware and predict these domains, so registrars didn't try to block them all. And um, so, if you look at DNS requests per hour, infected machines often have many more requests per hour. They're doing all these calls trying to find the command and control server, and uh, normal traffic is much less. You can also, like I mentioned, open, open DNS will make your network much safer if you use it. Because if you try to go to a malicious domain that is known to be a phishing site, OpenDNS will block it. Even though it is technically still on the internet, they will add the security feature of refusing to resolve it and instead putting up a page saying, no, don't go here, this is a bad site. So it will protect your users uh, in addition to other defenses they might have like antivirus and such. That's OpenDNS. They're also highly available and they support all the latest protocols. They're a local company. Hired a bunch of our students, think they got bought out by Cisco. They're a very good company. They have, a, I think every Tuesday night, they have like a training event. They used to, late night there, and they seem very good. I'm always teaching, so I haven't been able to go, but my students that went said it's good. What's that? Yeah, I know where they used to be, yeah. Okay, so, so they're good. Storm Room was another one. They would distribute by a peer-to-peer -peer system uh, and mutate every 30 minutes. And here's one of the ones where Microsoft took over this domain with authorization from a court order, and then everyone complained that you were actually taking over servers that had already been taken over by another malware researcher, but they didn't know that, and so everyone started yelling and blaming each other and trying to... There's a collateral damage. All right. And then, like I mentioned, here's, here's the Python script. There it is in all its glory. Six lines of Python, and you can see everybody's DNS queries. It's really easy to do, and you can see what everybody is doing and when they did it. 
So your privacy is pretty much an illusion. And by the way, the same thing is true of HTTPS. I was sort of horrified when I tried to do that. HTTPS encrypts your traffic, but before it can encrypt it, it has to get the, the certificate, and the certificate has the domain name of the target in plain text. So you can still see what everybody's doing. You don't get the contents of the, their password and stuff, but you see the domain names they're going to. So you know that's probably enough to compromise their privacy. So this is a fundamental protocol problem of the original DNS using uh, UDP unencrypted. Um, this means not only can anybody snoop on the traffic, anybody can modify the traffic, and you can't tell the altered traffic because there's no authentication mechanism. There's no signature or anything. So it's a problem. And so if you have a DNS outage, you'll lose availability of your servers. And if you modify DNS servers, you can now send spam, go to phishing sites, redirect people to sites that have malware. You know, you can do a lot of harm by redirecting traffic. And of course, uh, we're now in the world of cyber war. Cyber war is definitely going on. That's why all the huge furor is going on in Washington. Uh, Russia certainly used cyber attacks to influence our election. Now, I don't personally understand why we're trying to pretend to be so horrified because we've been doing it to everybody for a long time. <laughs> uh, we are the number, in my opinion, we are the number one aggressor in cyberspace. We have the most smart people. We have the most computers. The NSA and Cyber Command are vigorously hacking everybody. This is why, you know, China keeps hacking us like crazy and stealing our stuff. And every time they complain to China, it says, we're hacking you. You're hacking us. We're hacking us 10 times more than we're hacking you, which I think is probably true. But anyway, um, Moscow, Russia certainly interferes with elections. Estonia decided 10 years ago to have an electronic internet election, which was probably not the most brilliant thing they could have done <laughs> because the Russians totally hacked them and messed up their election. We haven't started doing internet voting yet, and we shouldn't. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes, that's right. I saw this in the news. Somebody like yeah. Kentucky said they wanted to have an election with like a phone app, and all the security experts said no. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I gotta bring this one up. Yeah, <laughs> hey, remind me. I had to bring this up. Oh yeah. Yeah, well, that's not the one I thought it is. There's next. There's recent XKCD about voting machine. Anyway, voting in blockchain. See if I can find it because that's that's worth mentioning. Um, and. 2030. There, this is probably it. I ought to bring it up, and I ought to be in my slides. This is probably the one. You're just like last week. During the area, here you are. So airplane designers will tell you airplanes are safe, and elevated people tell you elevators are safe. But if you ask computer engineers and security people about computerized voting, they say, you're out of your mind. <laughs> and so I say, why is this? And this is the way it really is. You say, you know, this is hard to explain, but we are really, really bad at what we do. And if you trust us, everyone will die. <laughs> and that, this, by the way, I, another simple way to summarize, look at how full this classroom is. The reason this class is full is because everybody's hiring security experts like crazy. And the reason they're hiring security experts like crazy is because we're terrible at our job and we don't really save them very much. So you keep having to hire more of us. You know, If we were actually any good at this, they wouldn't have to hire so many of us. But it's a really big problem. And uh, everybody needs more and more security people because we are so ineffective. Anyway, that's, that's the current state of the thing. We're doing the best we can, but the criminals are smart too. And uh, anyway, and of course, blockchains just make it 10 times worse. Holy cow, there's no way in the world blockchains make it any better. Um, anyway, so I got a cahoot about this, and I think that's as far as I'm going to do tonight. We'll do the rest next time because I want to just uh, talk a little bit about the projects. So one more cahoot is enough. Let's leave this one and... Uh, Chapter 1B, that's my plan. Okay. Classic. All right. Uh, wait, I can't start it yet. Whoops, I got to have people. Okay. Not much point to eat until some people are in there. Okay. Uh.
Where you get what? No, no. Uh, this does. This is only for extra credit. Uh, there's the homework is on my website, yeah. and I'll I'll show you that in a minute. After this, yeah. Uh, you probably could, yeah. But I think it. But I think you'd probably you lose because speed counts. You can. You can totally. There are various attacks on Kahoot. If you hack it, it's interesting. Yeah. 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 That's cool. I'm gonna give it like another five or six seconds. <laughs> all right, I think we got them all. Oh, here comes another. Okay. Eh. If you hack my stuff, you get extra credit. Hacking Kahoot, try not to hurt them. But there are a bunch of attacks on Kahoot. All right. So let's see how it goes. So, um, all right. What do you detect if you monitor the DNS package? Right. All you know is what domains they went to. You don't really know every page or anything, and you don't really know what they did there. You don't know if it was a streaming service or a download or a web page. You just know what domains they went to. All right. What will block access to malicious servers? All right, open DNS is the only thing here that does, and this says you might think that Comcast would block it, but they don't. ISPs are not in the business, and Cloudflare has very often been criticized for failing to block malicious websites, but the CEO of Cloudflare, I know, in fact, we're friends because of this. He was attacked roundly in 2011 for failing to block malicious websites, and I was the first guy to jump to his defense saying he's doing the right thing. He's like an internet service provider. His job is to just connect you to the servers, not to try to censor the internet. That's not going to go anywhere good. But now he's having to censor the internet, just like Twitter is and Facebook is having to. Now people have gotten so mad about political content on the internet that almost every company is being forced to hire censors to censor the internet in America, like they do in China. So the Chinese must be laughing at us. We put them down for years for the Great Firewall of China, and now we're building our own version of the same thing. Yeah. Blocks access to malicious servers or from malicious servers? Uh, to them. So when you're, if people get email and they click on the link to try to go to what isn't really the bank, it will not show the page. It blocks access to the server. It blocks it at the DNS level. So when you try to get the address of the phishing site, it gives you a different address and shows you a page saying, nope, you can't go there. It's a bad site. Yeah. Yeah. When you were talking about that's a program that you install on your servers? Or it's, it's, very, it's a service that's running in the cloud. All you do is change your IP addresses to point to it. It's 208-67-220-220. Okay. You put that in for your DNS server, and you're using the free version of OpenDNS. And if you pay them, you can get fancier features. I yeah. I but even though the free version will give you this service where it locks all the known malware domains, which is pretty good. All right. So which technique makes packet floods stronger? All right, it's DRDOS, distributed reflected DOS, where you bounce it off a server which amplifies the attack because it's running something like DNS for a small request has a big answer. All right. Which technology allows larger DNS replies over UDP? Thus making the previous problem bigger. All right, 
That's uh, extended DNS. EDNS puts larger packets still over UDP. All right. Which technique makes it possible to link a DNS name to a portable device? You could serve a web page from your cell phone if you wanted to, if it's Android. I don't think you'll have much luck doing it on an iPhone. All right, that's dynamic DNS, DDNS. All right, what portion of DNS traffic is encrypted? None of it, not anywhere at any level. Even DNSSEC does not encrypt anything. All it does is sign it so you know it's authentic, but it's still not encrypted. As far as protecting your privacy, there is nothing out there except some very infantile projects that are totally not ready for prime time. It's uh, pretty awful. However, to be fair, the one thing that you can do to protect yourself now is use a VPN. Although 80% of the VPNs don't encrypt the DNS either. So, um, but I don't know about that one. Is that a DNA? But I know most, it's just, there was a study a couple of years ago where they took like all the popular, many popular DNSs and they found that 80% of them when installed do not really encrypt all the traffic. What a lot of them do is they encrypt like your main traffic going to the internet, but they do not encrypt the DNS. So you're still leaking out your secrets. It is actually not very easy to really run all your traffic through the virtual private network. And that's what you must do if you want to protect your privacy. So, uh, Amparo, Benham, and Squiggle. <laughs> all right, as you guys, all right, so let me just point out the projects and then I'll, um, before you guys leave, you should tell me who you are if you wanna get your points. I always have some people that don't seem to care about the points and that's an option. So you're asking how you get your points. There, everything is at samsclass.info. You go to CNET 40 and your home, your points come from two things. There are quizzes. There's a quiz on each chapter, and uh, they start being due at the next class. By the way, the next class is not until September 12th, three or four weeks away. So don't bother coming next week. I won't be here. Um, and uh, you should have the first two quizzes done then on chapter one and two. We covered most of chapter one. We'll do the rest next time. Do those have to be done like midnight the night before? Uh, up, you have to do them a half hour before class. Yeah, so up until uh, 5.30. And you can actually do them after that, and I will take two points off for being late if I can get around to it. The scoring system won't automatically do it. I'm not promising to be too good at really punishing you for it, but I'm planning to. Yeah. Uh, you need to answer, you, you need to read your city college email, and you should have an invitation to the course. And, uh, and since you just added, it may be a while before I get you on there, maybe a week, but you'll get an email and that'll get you in this Canvas system. It's not the normal City College Canvas system. I use my own server because I'm using advanced features that they don't let me use on this system. And um, yeah, and then, and then, so that's the quizzes. That's part of your grade. And the rest of your grade is homework projects. And I'm just gonna show you, here they are. There's six of them that are required. And there's a bunch of extra credit ones you can do for extra points. Um, so it's very easy to do enough projects to get an A just on projects. And I highly recommend that. Um, so let me just talk about the first one, which is the one that's due in at the next class meeting in three or four weeks, um, which is setting up a DNS server on Windows. So if you already have a Windows server of some type, you can use it. But if you want to make a new one, uh, it's easy enough to do. Microsoft has a free trial version of Windows Server you can get here. So I have projects. I use this in my other classes like 123. This is my standard machine now, Windows Server 2016. I try not to be too out of date. So you can get a 180 day evaluation copy and you can extend the trial six times. So it's three and a half years. And if you let it trial out, you just have to reinstall it. So it's really no big deal. You get this evaluation, you install Windows in a virtual machine uh, using VMware or VirtualBox or Hyper-V. And um, you will end up with a machine you can run. And let me just bring up mine. I've got one here. So after you install it, you will have Windows Server 2016 running in a simulated hardware in a virtual machine. How many people have used VMware or some virtual editing product? Yeah, most people. That's what I thought. 
By the way, I'm, this is pretty stupid, and I'm planning to get away from it. You should be using the cloud. This should be Amazon machine. Putting this stuff in the cloud is really valuable, and I totally want to get there, but I haven't yet gotten to rewrite all my projects to go there. But that would be much cooler to put it in the cloud than to run this local VMware stuff, which is really no importance in the real world. But anyway, that's it. We're still doing it that way because I haven't found a cloud service that we can get enough free time on. Yeah. Don't the cloud services use virtual machines? They do. But if you learn how to control cloud services, that is a highly marketable skill. And if you learn how to use VMware locally, that is not worth anything. So I really want to switch all my projects to make you guys practice controlling everything in the cloud. Yeah, but so far, I haven't found a good cloud service that'll do it for cheap enough. But if we're talking about trying to increase our partnership with Amazon to get more Amazon time for the students. And if you have to give each of you enough Amazon free credits, we could do it. And if any of you want to just put all your stuff in the cloud and you're willing to pay a few bucks or burn your Amazon free trial for it, that would be awesome. And I'll give you extra credit. Anyway, so you got a Windows server. And um, you just have to install DNS on this thing. And that is very simple. Mike, that's the reason why people use Windows. They make everything easy. So um, uh, what is this nonsense? Sir, why am I seeing the old pictures in this one? Refresh, maybe? I'm seeing pictures of 2008. That's annoying. Right. Well, I'm going to have to work on that. I don't know what's going on here. Um, hopefully... Yeah, this is the wrong set of images. Something has happened. All right, I'll have to update. Yeah. Since we decided to run everything in the cloud, Amazon, um, do we still get some free, um, free version of Oh, sure. Oh, sure. That, that'll happen in a couple of weeks. You'll get free copies of Microsoft and VMware software. Anyway, let me just bring up my local copy of this project. Somehow the one on my server is strangely showing the old stuff. There we are, that's what you should see, and I don't know why it didn't upload correctly, but you have a server manager, and all you do is you add the server role DNS server. It's really point and click. This is why everybody uses Windows. It's very easy, and then you just click next, 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 and it installs it, and now you have a DNS server. Restart the machine, and so my machine here is a DNS server now, and you can tell, because if I do IP config, you will see, or if I do ibconfig slash all, there. Then you can see if I can get to my, uh, all right, let me try and make this fit on the screen as best I can. I probably need to lower the font size. This is one thing about VMware, the, the, um, the resolution changes strangely for modern versions of Windows. So this was like a reasonable size earlier and now it's ridiculous. Um, yeah, that, well, I would like to change the font to something. How about you stop complaining and let me do it? Uh, how about like 14 or something? That would be reasonable. Is there like a uh, OK button or something? I hope so. Oh, good. OK, thank you. This, ha this, ha this by the way, happens with Windows 10 also. The VMware, when you stop it and restart it, it will sometimes come out ridiculously huge. It's uh, VMware, the simulated graphics card doesn't get along very well with, um, with virtualization. Another reason why this is kind of DNS. So I'm going to pipe it to more so it doesn't scroll off the screen. Okay, now I can finally show you one or two. My DNS server is 127.0.0.1. I'm using my own machine as the DNS server. It is configured the same as your home router. It doesn't actually know anything. All it's doing is forwarding it to another server. But still, you can resolve things now. So I can now do NS lookup of yahoo.com and it will find from 127.0.0.1 it will find yahoo.com. Notice it timed out. This is a delightful feature of Windows and it will happen to you too. Windows DNS servers are so slow that when you query your own server it will time out. <laughs> and it takes more than four seconds to ask my own server right there. Not even, no network connection at all. You often have to try two or three times before it can answer the question, which is, I don't know how, I don't know, wouldn't know how to make anything that slow if I tried. But you know, like you say, the main thing you're going to learn about Windows DNS is don't use Windows DNS. You'll appreciate Linux a little more in case you don't already after you find out how much better it is. So the second time, it actually got all the answers. And Yahoo! is not messing around. They have six IP version six addresses and six IP version four addresses. They really want to serve up that Yahoo. So even if some of those are down or unaccessible, you'll find one of them you can get to. Um, and on you go. So you can look up various things here like ccsf.edu. 
And again, it got the address of City College's uh, web server there and it didn't take too long to do it. So now I'm, I have my own. And so you got a few things you do to show that you've got it working and you can go back and do a query of an authoritative server. Um, these are non-authoritative answers, right? They're told me non-authoritative. It got it from my local machine and my local machine is not the authoritative resolver. The authoritative resolver is tied to the um, domain as the start of authority and it is considered the master copy. All the other records are copies of that one. So if you add a new server to your domain, you put it on the authoritative server and as, as caches expire, the others will all update. Um, and so if you want to know if a server is not there, you have to ask the authoritative server. Because if you don't find it on some other server, that doesn't really prove anything. Only the authoritative server will say, no, that guy really is not here. And that's the game. These are non-authoritative answers. Uh, but you can get the authoritative answer. So let me just do that. If I do NSLOOKUP, which is Microsoft's built-in tool for this, you can do it in uh, interactive mode. And I can now set um, type equals any, which is an old fashioned way of getting everything about a domain. It doesn't always work, but it does work for ccsf.edu. And uh, so it's gonna ask my thing, it's gonna time out because Windows sucks. And if I keep asking it long enough, it'll get tired of timing out. Okay, now it's done timing out. And it's got me a lot of, now these, why we were having trouble with our email because we're using Microsoft email and they're having trouble getting the mail exchange records set up. We'll talk about this more later, but there are DNS records required to stop spam. You have to put special DNS records up if you send email and people will expect them to say, this is really the right server to send that email. And that's what this stuff is, SPF. There's two or three versions of it. All of them don't work very well. And, and if you get any of them wrong, which apparently we've had a problem this semester with having something wrong about one of them. So a lot of mail gets thrown away as spam. Anyway, um, here it tells you what our primary name server is, ns3.ccsf.edu. That is our authoritative name server. So if I want to, if I query that one, not just ccsf.edu, but do it to that server, then I will get an answer and it will not say non-authoritative. I'll timed out there because, you know, but uh, I will presumably eventually get an answer Anyway, I'm going to go to my project, and what you can do is you can get an authoritative answer here if you do this. Um, uh, there is a way to get the, you can turn on a diagnostic mode, which is here. Yes, set debug. If you do set debug, it will then tell you this is an authoritative answer. When we get to dig and Linux, this is the AA flag which tells you not only did you get the address of this server, but you got it from the primary server, the start of authority, the absolute final record, which is not what you usually get. You usually get a copy of a copy of a copy, who knows how out of date from your local device because it's good enough. But when you do have an authoritative record in debug mode, it will tell you that. Anyway, so uh, that's the game. So do that, you send in screens. When you're done, you get some screenshots. This thing here where you see a hand, you take that screen image and you email these at, at, to this address, at the end, you turn them into that address with some images attached, and that's how you get your points. I have a long suffering grader that reads all that email. Yeah. So um, when you make a request to your DNS server, yeah. where does it first go to? Uh, when you, if you're, say, at home and you connect, the first thing it does is go to your router, and your router just forwards it to your ISP. Okay. And their servers handle, unless you've configured your router to go somewhere else, like Google or OpenDNS, go somewhere in the cloud to get it. And that's usually as far as it has to go. Okay. You yeah. your own DNS. Where is your DNS going to go? It's going to go to the same thing, ultimately. Okay, so it's, it's going to go to another DNS server. It's going to go to another DNS server. It's got to get the records somewhere. Now, if you configure an authoritative DNS server, I actually have to feed in the records with a zone. And that's a good thing you asked that because that's the other project. So this is the first project. You just get a server running on Windows. And let me just briefly talk about the others. Then you do the same thing on Linux. Then you play with Dig to try all kinds of things about it. Then we're going to look at the source port and the dynamic updates, which is one of the major problems at Windows servers, and the login things. Are, those are the main projects. But down here, you can actually make authoritative servers on Windows or on Linux. And those are much more complicated to set up. What we're setting up now are recursive servers that don't actually know anything. They just ask somebody else and tell you. Um, an authoritative server is actually the primary source of data, so you actually have to configure a zone file and put it in which tells it, here's what I've got on my local network that you should tell the world about. And so it's a good thing to do, and I put it here in the extra credit project because it's uh, kind of, but if you actually set up a 
DNS server for a domain at your company, it has to be authoritative and you have to do it on one of these products. And uh, there's other ones down here. Here's some of the security features. There is a thing called DNS over HTTPS, which encrypts all the things, which is fine, but it does not, it's not included in any operating system by default and it doesn't work very well. It's too new. There's other things too that encrypt DNS. There's three protocols I know that do it. There's DNS curve and DNS crypt that all do it, but none of them work. They work so badly I couldn't even give them to you for homework because people would install it and like half the students, it just totally wouldn't work even when you installed it right. It's really pathetic. They're so far from being ready for prime time. They're like in the early alpha testing stage. Yeah? Would you get your own domain name by making your own um, definitive server and then no, you have to buy a domain name from a real domain name registrar and they have to be approved for this and they have to pay 500 bucks for every update. So it's like a phone number, a public phone number. You have to get it from a company like uh, Go to GoDaddy or something. So is there a I can. I can or I am, I think. And yeah, you can become one, but you have to pay a fee and you have to pay for every update. So really you have to be a commercial company. That's why you have you pay to get a domain name and that does not include hosting. All it means is they'll give an IP address on your domain name. And you can, and then you can post it on your own machine or anywhere, and they'll put that address in there. But you can't. Um, now, by the way, you could put up a server all by yourself and start advertising a domain, and then you'd be a pirate domain, like Pirate Radio, and those are out there. This is why when IP version four ran out of space, which happened a couple years ago, um, they finally had to sell the undesirable IP address ranges, like the one starting with one. And those were undesirable because they were already heavily being used by criminals and spammers without being officially registered. You can do it just like you can run pirate radio without FCC approval. Um, you can use addresses that are not officially recognized. And of course, uh, it's kind of a mess, but the criminals do it and so on. So, you know, everything happens on the internet. Anyway, that's all I wanted to show you. And the other, uh, there is a, if you want to work at home on your laptop, you can certainly do it. And I recommend it. But if you want to work on campus, there is a lab here. I'll go down there after class and anybody wants to check it out or try doing homework here, you can do it in Science 214 down the hall. It is a free fire zone in there. People put key loggers and remote control clients and everything else in there. So don't do any credit card numbers or personal stuff in there. And if you do get halfway through homework and come back next week, it's entirely possible that some other clown has wiped it out and installed Linux on top of your operating system or something. So you anything in there is subject to arbitrary hackation. So be aware of that. Uh, don't, don't expect privacy and don't freak out if something bad happens in there. But in turn, you can try any kind of experiments in there. And um, you know, if, if you're late on something, let me know. I'm probably not going to be too aggressive with late policies in this class, being one unit class. But um, you know, if, you, if you get hosed in there, let me know. But uh, if you have any goofy thing you want to try in there, go ahead and do it. Some people are mining cryptocurrencies in there and stuff. You know, anything. Wow. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, right now, I'm only opening at the end of each class, but in a week or two, we'll have regular hours posted. I need to assemble my army of volunteers who will be in there opening it. Um, usually by the second or third week of class, it's open pretty much all the time. But right now, I'm opening it every night after class. And uh, uh, by next week, I'll probably have a schedule. It'll be on my website, and I'll put it on the door. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, these instructions right now are on 2008, but you can totally do it on 2016, of course. Uh, these, I'm going to update the instructions when I get to it. By the way, uh, one of these you really have to use 2008 for, which is that Kaminsky attack, which is pretty awesome, but they fixed it. So if you actually want a 2008 machine, you'll find it down here. Here's one I designed for the malware analysis class. You can download it there, then you've got a 2008 to play with if you want to, because they're not that easy to find anymore. So if you want to do... Some of these are just old instructions written for 2008, and you could use that machine to do them. This one here, you must have an old machine or it won't work. So, and here's, here's an old machine to get and use. So if you're actually interested in that stuff, you can install the old thing and use it, but for most of us, who cares about old stuff? Just do the other projects instead. Anything else? All right, well, I'm gonna turn on the lights to clean up, get down to the lab. Um, you're free to go. I'll see you in the Stick around and answer any questions. I'm going to stop the share and the recording. Oh, yeah. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear it. I, I've, I'd like to.